Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, it's nice to see that we have another full house at the Field House. It's actually taken me all week to use that alliteration. I'm Margaret Lowe Smith. I'm president of Atlantic Live. Welcome to our final morning briefing on this last day, the culmination of the 2016 Democratic Convention. Before we begin, I do want to thank our underwriters who actually made our week and our work here possible. They are the American Petroleum Institute's Vote for Energy Project, AFT, Makers Mark, and Pasira. Tonight, Hillary Clinton will take the stage at the Wells Fargo Center and formally accept the nomination as a Democratic candidate for President of the United States. <laughs> After that, the, convent, the general election is in full swing, and there are 102 days until November 8th, and we've got some of the Democratic Party's top campaign advisors here to lay out the road to the White House, what it will take to win in November. I suspect this conversation will uh, contribute to a lot of tweeting, so just to let you know, our hashtag is the Atlantic DNC. And now, let's roll. Please welcome Stephanie Cutter. She was deputy campaign manager for President Barack Obama's 2012 re-election campaign and is now a partner in the strategic communications firm Precision Strategies. Welcome, Stephanie. <laughs> Pollster Stanley Greenberg is the CEO of the polling firm Greenberg Quinlan Rosner. He advised the campaigns of Bill Clinton, Al Gore, John Kerry, to name a few. Patty so Patty Solis Doyle was an advisor during both of President Obama's campaign, managed Hillary Clinton's 2006 Senate re-election and her 2008 campaign for the White House. She now runs her own strategy firm. Welcome. And David Axelrod is the former chief strategist and senior advisor to President Obama. He's a best-selling author. His memoir is called Believer, My 40 Years in Politics. He's now the director of the University of Chicago's Institute of Politics and host of the podcast, The Axe Files. Welcome. My colleague, Atlantic senior editor Ron Brownstein is here with CBS News chief congressional correspondent Nancy Cordes to lead the conversation. Nancy and Ron, take it away. Good morning, everybody. I know there are some people who were thinking last night when they were chanting four more years, the thought in your head was one more day. Um, <laughs> But I am, could not be more excited to be here. Uh, you know, not since James Farley dined alone, or maybe since James Farley dined with Franklin Roosevelt, has there been so much political talent on one stage. Um, uh, we've got some really sharp minds here to talk really about three things. We're going to talk about what the convention has accomplished so far, what Hillary Clinton has to accomplish in her acceptance speech tonight, and then what the road to the White House looks like on, in the general election. So David, let me start with you, because you did get quite emotional last night after watching uh, the president. What is your sense on what these first three nights of the convention has accomplished? What kind of grade do you give it, and what, have they, what kind of messages have they moved forward? Well, first of all, let me say how uh, pleased I am to the, I was. We were quite late, Patty and I, did, yeah. but the chance to talk about non-college educated whites you know, Polish of the Senate with Ron Brower <laughs> yeah. was enough to get me out of bed. You yeah. um, listen, I think that I think it's been a very successful convention. It's been striking to watch the difference between this convention and the one I saw last week in Cleveland. Now I get to go to both of them, you know, now that I'm working for right. CNN. And it was sort of like it's been like the difference between the Broadway production of Hamilton and a class play. Uh, so, uh, you know, this one has been very well conceived, very well produced. Uh, I think that um, what this convention has done is not only unified the party, uh, which was, you know, there, there's still divisions, and we saw it in the hall last night, it, but in the main, it's unified the party, uh, but it's also created a permission structure for potential uh, uh, new voters uh, in this election, anti-Trump voters, particularly uh, suburban Republicans and independent type voters, the co college educated voters, uh, to, uh, to join in. So I think that it's not only unified the base uh, thus far, but also, and Mike Bloomberg represented it, uh, there's been outreach that could uh, actually grow her vote. Patty, the most important things the convention has accomplished so far, in your view? Um, you know, I, I agree with David. I think this convention has been incredible uh, and uh, very methodical. You know, uh, Monday night was, 
unity night. Give Bernie Sanders his due. Let the Bernie or bus people and the Bernie supporters sort of give them the opportunity to heal. And um, Michelle Obama really sort of set the stage for what's going to happen next. Uh, Tuesday was all about uh, telling Hillary's story uh, in a very humanizing way, uh, of course, with Bill Clinton talking about their courtship, talking about um, their marriage, talking about her, her, her life as a public servant and a social justice warrior, as my daughter likes to call her. And then last night, I mean, it was, a, it was about passing the baton from uh, uh, this uh, president to the next. Uh, so I think it, it has been truly uh, amazing. Uh, and tonight, really, the bar has been set very high, and it's mm. all about her tonight. So uh, I'm sitting on pins and needles over uh, here. Just going through the row here, and then, and then I turn it over to my colleague. Stan, thinking about the electorate, where do you think they have, where, who have they spoken to the most effectively, uh, and who perhaps have they spoken to less effectively? Joe Biden said yesterday on MSNBC, I think there has been in both parties not enough respect shown to ordinary people uh, busting their necks. Uh, who, have, who have they talked to, and where, where have they kind of fallen short? Yeah. If any. Again, thanks for the early for being here so early. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and for the coffee. The um, great branding, by the way. I think really uh, um, all the Atlantic like, coffee. Well, I, yeah. Like I think we're, I think we're all in the same place that this has been usually successful. I think they've built they've I think they've built chapters uh, that are you know carrying forward to t tonight, um, which I think will also be successful. Everything we're watching tells me they know what they're doing and how to, br to bring this together and close it in a powerful way. Last night, them joining together, um, I think, and passing the baton uh, was, uh, was very powerful. I was, I'm also struck, first of all, since I sit in the, since my wife is a, um, a delegate, uh, and so I sit in the Connecticut delegation, and I look at California, and I look at the Sanders voters. And there are real divisions there in the Democratic Party. Not, I used to dismiss them, but they are actually you know, you know, quite real. But I've really been impressive, not just the first night, um, the way the roll call was used um, as a you know, way of talking about it, the way the president last night uh, acknowledged the Sanders voters and their issues um, and, embr and embraced them. And you know, obviously, this is building to the close, but I, c I can't imagine this being more successful at that point. The, pr the, the one problem I have, um, it's, not a, it's not a trivial problem. The, this is a view of America, a great America. I mean, there's a message here. The, and and, the, and there's a great temptation to be, this is a diverse, this, is a, this, this party is celebrating a diverse, open, inclusive country that believes in multiculturalism, unity, you know, uh, you know out of our great diversity. That's our strength. We're confident to show it. Now, we're either wrong <laughs> about where the country is. I think I don't think we are, and it's who we are. And so this was a celebration of diversity and unity. Um, it was a uh, it was a uh, focus on experience and uh, on Hillary being the you know, most experienced candidate since, since the beginning of you know of time. Uh, but it was not about. Struck, and, and, and overall, the, the president's message was the country's in great shape. There's a great America. America's great. There's been the change theme, even though it was obviously raised in the first night, and even though the uh, the Bill Clinton, uh, you know, narration right. was about the change, you know, Hillary as a change agent, you didn't come away from this saying this, these people are unhappy about what's happening in the country on inequality, the struggles that people are going through, and the, there's, it's it's very hard um, you know, when you they, to find the balance when you're trying to move from the legacy of Barack Obama to actually talking about the huge problems facing ordinary people. So, so I think, I think, right, I think Biden is right. And please jump in. Has it been more about social inclusion than about yes. economic opportunity? Yes, I, I think that, yes, this is about a cultural, and also it sets up a contrast, a powerful contrast. You have a, a contrast on experience with a, with a not, not just unqualified, a, a, um, a, a candidate that's ready to betray its own country. I mean, you've got a huge contrast at the level of experience. You've got a huge contrast on a divisive party that's exclusionary versus a party that's unifying. You can win on these things. But what's not there, even though these things, themes were there each night, there's not that we have, we have huge problems in this country. We need big changes uh, in our economics and politics. That's not 
there. Can I just uh, just mm -hmm. jump on one thing here, mm -hmm. which is I think experience is clearly um, something that's been stressed, but I think the, the word that I heard more often than any last night in sort of the, the, the in setting up the contrast was stable. She's, she's stable. Mm -hmm. And then you heard the flip side with Bloomberg basically saying that Trump is unstable. Mm -hmm. And I think that this issue of temperament uh, is central to this whole debate. Mm -hmm. uh, there, you know, what a lot of the speakers are trying to set up there, particularly around the national security issues, was mm -hmm. she's stable, she's rational, you know, she's not going to start a Steady. nuclear war. Mm -hmm. yeah. Stephanie, it seems like uh, another big focus of this convention has been to humanize Hillary Clinton, to give us a little more insight into who she is as a person. I talked to a lot of women delegates uh, the other night who said that their favorite part about Bill Clinton's speech was when he talked about her uh, getting on her knees in Chelsea's dorm room and putting the contact paper in the drawers because they felt like, you know, I yeah. can really relate to that. I've, you know, I've done the same thing. I get that. But unless I missed it, I didn't hear one personal story from President Obama or Vice President Biden last night about in their relationship with her during her four years in the administration. You know, Vice President Biden said at one point, we had breakfast together every week, and I was like, oh, you know, I can't wait to hear a story about those, those breakfasts. But then he moved on. Do you think that those stories just aren't there, or I, I think do they need a female speechwriter to put them in? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> uh, I, I think those stories are there, but I think that probably wasn't the essential purpose of those speeches. I mean, there were stories. The president talked about, you know, the race in 08 and how every time uh, he thought the race was over, Hillary came back stronger and smarter. Mm -hmm. uh, and when the race was finally over, uh, she joined his team. And what type of a person you, you are when you're able to do that after such a hard-fought race, uh, you can put that behind you and do what's right for the country and join the team that uh, President uh, Obama was ushering into Washington. That, that says a lot about Hillary Clinton. We might not have the personal anecdote, he, you know, she said this and I said that, but mm -hmm. it certainly tells something about Hillary Clinton. Uh, Vice President Biden talked about their friendship, the, the lunch that they had every week, um, and uh, her qualifications. There was nobody who's ever run for president that's more qualified. Um, so I think everybody has had a certain purpose um, in their <coughs> speech. Michelle Obama, uh, you know, I thought that that purpose was, uh, was an incredible speech, um, moved me um, incredibly, um, but, but to put uh, some bigger context around the election, that it's not about how, you know, I mean, it is, about, it's an important part to say how crazy Trump is because he is crazy. Uh, but it's also important to think about this uh, in a larger context. Uh, whoever is the president next is going to be making decisions for our children. And there's not a mother out there that didn't s sit back and say, that's right, it's not about the back and forth here, who has the better ads or the better one lines, but this is about my kid. Mm -hmm. And I think she was so effective in putting in the, uh, the election in that context, really lifting it up. And then Bill Clinton, uh, I think that there, uh, there was a lot that people learned about Hillary Clinton that they didn't know because of that speech. And yeah. that was really the purpose of that speech. I learned a lot. I worked mm -hmm. for the Clintons for eight years uh, before I went to work for President Obama. Uh, there was stuff in that speech that I didn't know. Uh, so I think people watching on TV, millions of people watching on TV, saw her bio uh, unfiltered uh, in the way that um, the Clintons wanted to tell it. And th that, I think, will go down as being incredibly impactful in righting some of the wrongs that have happened. I actually thought that on the Bill Clinton speech um, that the first 25 minutes were the most important <laughs> Uh, when he was imparting these personal stories. I, I find him less effective when he's making political arguments for her because he gets emotionally involved in them, as anyone would, mm -hmm. uh, as Stan Greenberg probably does when he goes out and campaigns for his wife. <laughs> uh, but th those personal stories were so important. But your point is interesting because I, I think this has been a very well-conceived convention, but they have siloed the nights, right? Yeah. So the, the night before last night, there were a lot of personal stories, and a lot of them came from people she interacted with, uh, that uh, powerful woman, uh, the 9-11 mm -hmm. survivor, and others whose lives she had touched. Um, there was, last night was very much about 
I think setting up this, the strong, stable uh, leader versus the crazy man context. Right. Um, so, you know, they, they're approaching this in a sequential way. I, I, I want to jump into just because, you know, I, I worked for Hillary for a long time, like, I don't know, a long time, almost 20 years. And um, it always comes down, what's fascinating to me, it always comes down to humanizing Hillary just because, look, People know that she's smart, people know that she's strong, people know that she's qualified, they know she's tough, but they don't know if they like her. Uh, and this has been going on for 30 years since she's been in public life, since the beginning that she's been thrust into public life back in 1992, and Stan can speak to that as well. Um, so I think the things that voter, the, the most important things that voters are looking for is can they relate to her? Can they, I mean, can they get past that, I don't trust her, I think she's a liar, I don't particularly like her, and I think that's what this convention has been about, and I think when she goes up there tonight, if she can get personal and if she can get, um, if she can relate to the American people and have them relate to her, I think that's just going to top this thing off. I'll follow up on that, because I'd like to ask about a couple of the important message choices that have been made in the first night. And the first question goes to <clears throat> the Tuesday night emphasis that David was alluding to. And it, it seemed a very, and, and if you talk to John Podesta was here yesterday, and Robbie Mook, uh, who I saw at a Wall Street Journal lunch, it's pretty clear that they believe that the response to the question of whether you can trust her is to say you can trust her to fight for the things that you care about, <laughs> yes. Rather she, than she never that, quits. rather than that, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, every single parsing every single statement on emails. It's that she cares about people like you is the answer. Yeah. That you can't trust her. Mm -hmm. um, Stan, you work with Bill Clinton, who faced some mm -hmm. similar problems. I've noted a few times that on election day in 1996, 54 percent of the voters in the exit poll said he was not honest and trustworthy on a day that he won by eight points. Mm -hmm. So can you, in effect, neutralize questions about honesty by uh, establishing empathy and we'll fight for you? Right. Um, you can, but a, a lot of this has to do with where, uh, where voters are trying to, uh, to get to. Um, and I do think a lot of voters are trying to figure out how to get to not vote for Trump and then to vote for Hillary and then begin to, f to grab onto those things that help them do it. And it may not be that on likability. And let, let, you know, let's remember, and, and Anna Greenberg is writing about this, so I should I steal from different parts of my family. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> let's remember how how often Hillary tops as the most admired woman um, uh, in America, um, tops that list. How many years uh, that she's topped that list? At the same time that you know that you have this unfavorability. That number's twenty, by the way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, so oh, you've no, got ten, you know sorry. she's you know she's a. a a powerful figure, and I do think people are trying to figure out how. And I think what they are doing in, in Bill Clinton's case, you know, we we ended the uh, the primar uh, primaries in terrible shape on trust. Um, if I were a typical politician, would say anything not trustworthy, mm -hmm. um, and that was linked to this perception that he was a rich guy, privileged, and hum being humble was like the main humble origins was the like the main the message. Antidote. People was you know, the main mm -hmm. antidote to that. Right. right. Message. Um, and here, I think it's right. I think they, they've made a decision. I'm sure they've looked at this closely. What's believable is that she's an advocate for people and is dogged, and she's uh, for the vulnerable, for the people that you know, really need help. You can count on her. They're clearly, you wouldn't have had you know, pr uh, President Clinton doing what he did unless you know, they believe that's what people need to get to that vote. So does she need, um, a, uh, by election day, does she need a majority of the country to say she is honest and trustworthy in order to win, or can no. she win? No, a majority can still say she's not, and she can win that, she can still well, win. Well, I think what you need is, a, is, a, is a, a, a large number saying that she will fight for me, and, and I can trust her. To, to fight for me. That's yeah. the trust. Well, I think yeah. she needs a majority of people to say she's more trustworthy than the other guy. Yes. You think she does? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you know the old joke about I don't have to outrun the bear, I just have to <laughs> but, outrun you. Mm -hmm. But right now, it's the <laughs> right. other way around in the polls. Right, right. And right now, he's also leading her on you know, the measure of who could handle the economy better. And interestingly, he's essentially tied with her in a lot of the polls on who could handle terrorism better. And she's the former Secretary of First State. First of all, uh, I should point out that on election day in 2012, Mitt Romney also led Barack Obama by that, on that same measure because I think there's a certain uh, presumption that goes to someone who calls themselves 
uh, a businessman, and it kind of impugns Mitt Romney uh, to put him and Donald Trump in the same category, but, uh, but, but there is that uh, presumption that in the sort of macro economy, a businessman will do better. But the bigger measure, and the one that Obama won on, was about who, economic advocacy and who's going to advocate for your economic interests. And I think that's the one that is important to win because uh, in response to Ron's question, I, I think people fundamentally, you know, they, they vote their own interests and who they think will do uh, the most for them. And uh, so if she can win that contest. The other thing is on the terrorism front and all of those issues, I think we have to wait a few weeks until after these conventions are done to see how these issues settle in because some of these measures were taken right after a Republican convention in which, you know, America and the world was described as Gotham City and, uh, and Trump presented himself as Batman, you mm -hmm. know. <laughs> uh, can I ask about one, I want to ask Stephanie about, because you know, on, on your resume, which we did mention, includes a lot of time in the Senate. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask about one of the other striking message choices they made in the first few nights, and particularly last night, which was to present Trump not as the culmination of the Republican Party, not tying him to the Republican Party, but as something separate from the Republican <coughs> Party. And clearly, that was designed to make it easier. A permission structure is the word of the week. Create a permission structure for Republicans, people who ordinarily vote Republican, to not vote for him. But does that make it harder to tie Republican candidates? to Trump. What did you think of that decision to essentially say Trump mm -hmm. is not really part of the Republican Party, he's mm -hmm. something completely different? Well, they're th making an appeal to Republicans uh, to vote a Democratic ticket um, and to come over and vote for Hillary, specifically. Um, I think it's a smart thing to do. Uh, I'm sure there's nervousness at the DSCC <laughs> mm -hmm. and the DCCC right now. Uh, but what happens now is really up to Republican candidates, and so far, They've been wrapping their arms around Donald Trump, so they're, you know, are they are they going to denounce uh, the platform? No, they haven't. Their Repub their convention's already gone by. Are they going to denounce? Uh, I didn't see one of them step out yesterday to denounce what he said uh, on Russians hacking Hillary's emails. Uh, so it's really up to Republicans and to make sure. Uh, that they pay a price if they're not separating themselves. I think it's too late for them to do that because most of them have endorsed him. You can't take back your endorsement. Patty, what did you make of that choice to separate him from the Republican Party rather than bind the Republican Party to him? You know, um, for the moment, I, I mean, I, I thought it was a smart thing to do. Uh, I thought uh, we are going after some Republicans. I think uh, there are plenty of Republicans out there who just cannot do it. Like, they cannot pull the trigger for Donald Trump. And we're making a, a, a very assertive, aggressive effort to get those people. And I think that's a smart thing to do. And, you know, all politics is local for the rest of the ticket. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, they're going to run their races out in the states. And uh, this is for the greater good. Stan, one of the lines that I thought was most powerful uh, of the president's last night was when he said, uh, you know, we Americans, we don't want to be ruled. Yeah. Uh, and um, I thought that really got to the heart of, you know, mm -hmm. who the American people are, you know, and, and you know, the, the way that this democracy was founded. But how hard is it, you know, to, to really move the needle on opinion of Donald Trump in the polling? Because one thing I've heard again and again and again from Trump voters is, yes, I know he says outlandish things. I don't care because, you know, I think that we need to completely go into Washington and smash things up. High risk, high reward. But voters care. I mean, let's, let's, not, let's not misread what, what, what happened here. By, by the way, the, I think the president ma making that statement about, about, uh, about Trumpism mm -hmm. and about how he views democracy in some way makes his statement about America, the president's statement about America, bigger. It's not just about the economy is doing well and my legacy is great on the economy. It really is a bigger statement about America and a bigger critique of Trump and what it, and what and what and how odd, mm -hmm. uh, how at odds he is mm -hmm. uh, with the kind of country we both <coughs> are and, and and want to be. He called him a homegrown yeah. demagogue. But, yeah. but also, <laughs> uh, the Trump's negatives have never gone below sixty percent, and they've gone up to, with the general yeah. with the general electorate. It's not the case that people have watched Trump and said, well, I'm really beginning to admire that. It never happened. 
if you look at every single group that's in the ascendant electorate, but beyond that, look at women, look at college-educated voters, they become more and more negative. The more they watch, the more, they're not, nobody's fooled. Right. This hasn't worked. It's only worked within the Republican electorate. It has not worked in the country. So I'm not, I'm not worried about it that, you know, because he succeeded earlier. He's been the Can nominee I? for mm -hmm. how many months now? Four or five months? And he hasn't, in that time, has not expanded his vote. Uh, well, at all. In, and in the last well, few yeah. weeks, I mean, in the last few weeks, he, I mean, going in post James Comey, mm -hmm. I think he has expanded his. Vote. And he's leading yeah. among independents in a lot of uh, in, polls. In, in some polls, so uh, you know, well, you know Romney, given, Romney, given Romney, that Stan is right, <laughs> given, given, given that okay. Stan is right, uh, David, uh, you know, given that Stan is right, and maybe this is a way to kind of get uh, segue into the question of what Hillary Clinton needs to do tonight. Yeah. His unfavorables are at say he's polling well above his favorable rating. Yes. In, in polls, he's, he's polling well above the percentage who say he's qualified to be president. That has to be an indictment of the candidate on the other side at the moment. Well, she's got very high negatives, too. I mean, this is a, this is a, a unique race in that regard. I just want to reach back for one second to Nancy's point uh, on the president. I think there was more meaning to the president's statement about um, essentially depicting uh, uh, Trump as a, you know, as a kind of crypto fascist, really, is what he, he did. Uh, because I, I got so many emails after the speech from friends of mine on the Republican side, particularly conservatives. And think about what a true conservative believes. I mean, they don't want state control. They don't believe in this notion of the strong man who comes and is going to take care of all our problems. Um, I actually think with that riff, he 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 drew he uh, he widened the chasm between mm -hmm. Donald Trump and conservatives, uh, who are really frightened by. They don't believe Trump is a conservative. They believe that he is an autocrat, who who thinks that who's going to use the power of the state unilaterally, and uh, that that uh, frightens them. But back to your point, you know you've got two, very you know you've got two unpopular candidates, and that's just the. It goes back to, uh, you know, all I have to do is outrun the bear thing. Um, you know, and I don't think they're going to become, no, no one's going to solve all their problems with their, clearly Trump didn't, I don't think she will, I think she's making uh, some improvement. But the question is, relative to the other guy, are you making a persuasive case to one rally your base and the other to create this permission structure for voters who are still deciding to come over to you, and I think she's been more successful at that in this convention well, than the, he was at his. Given the you know very impressive framework that has been constructed in these first three nights, I think everyone would agree this has been a convention of extraordinary message, discipline, and some you know really powerful speeches at times. What does she have to do though to kind of fill in tonight? That? Tonight, what does she have to do tonight? What what are you looking for, maybe Patty Starr? What what are you looking for in her speech? What does she need to add to this picture that's been painted so far? I'm looking um, for a very aspirational speech. I mean, look, let's face it, her biggest uh, problem right now are her trust numbers and her dishonesty numbers. And so I think she needs to get past that. She, I mean, God bless, so many people have done a great job to go after that up until tonight. She needs to do it herself. Um, and you know, look, I love her. For, I love her. I love this woman. Uh, she is not the greatest candidate. Uh, she is fantastic at governing, trust me, but she is not the greatest uh, candidate or speech giver. She is not Barack Obama. She is not her husband. And her tendency in big speeches like this is to, you know, give her 12-point plan, her I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. She's very wonkish. Uh, she cannot do that tonight. Uh, the bar has been set very, very high. Uh, so I'm looking for, I want her to show a little leg. I, you know, I want her to... Um, uh, I'm glad I didn't <laughs> That means no pantsuit. I know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Raise that pant leg up. Um, I want her to let us in. Uh, I think that's what she has to do. And about Sam, what do you think she well, has to do tonight? Well, don't underestimate the... Um, the voters wanting to be re-educated <clears throat> uh, about leaders that they know. Uh, the uh, obviously I had the 92 convention, but the more important I think is the is 2000 and Al Gore. He was vice president for eight years. Mm -hmm. um, he had an eight point uh, bounce on his convention, but an eight point bounce at the state. He began way behind. 
um, moved, you know, even and then ahead before, before Labor Day, you know, after his um, um, convention. And he gained, two, he gained two points just while he was kissing his wife. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, it's a big, it's a big part of it. But you know, with Lieberman, it was it was it was seen to be a break. It was change. It was whatever it, whatever happened. It was saying it gave people some permission to move for someone they knew very well. So I would not, you know, if I'm if I'm thinking of Hillary Clinton here, she need uh, she will just as we there's a lot we didn't know in the in the Clinton President Clinton narrative. There's a lot we will not know in her narrative that we that we know now because we've advertised on her, you know, her her mother, her family. She will, you know, it'll be obvious that she's going to, you know, introduce that you know, herself uh, again, and she'll have a big audience for it. And I think that'll be a you know a big piece of it. But she also has to take um, she's got to make a big economic argument, which has not yet been made by this has party been. and by this convention. The, the first night was an economic argument, but it was a critique. Um, it, was, it was from the, those who have been making an argument in the primaries. Um, this, she needs to make a big economic argument to the country, because that's what Trump was doing. That's where Trump makes, you know, has his you know, potential to erode you know, where Democratic support is. So you know, I expect her to make a big economic argument. David, um, what conclusions can we draw, if any, from the fact that at least the first two nights of this convention were significantly more highly rated um, than the first two nights of the Republican convention. You drew more viewers uh, than the GOP convention, which is sort of counterintuitive because you would think that a lot of people would be tuning in to watch Donald Trump the entertainer. That's what you, know. you would think. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I thought one of the reasons uh, Donald Trump had that peculiar uh, press conference yesterday was that he saw these stories about the fact that his convention was less highly rated than the Democrat convention, and he could not stand it. And he just needed to blast his way back into the, into, I, I'm, I'm really serious about this. Um, I think part of it is that I think, I don't think there's a lot of enthusiasm within the Republican Party for his candidacy. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I, I, I think that was part of it. But honestly, um, I was sort of surprised by these, uh, by these ratings as well. Can I, I just, on this issue of, uh, so the, so I don't really have a great explanation, so I'm going to answer the, pat, the last question um, uh, in terms of what she has to do tonight. Uh, you know, Hillary Clinton, Mario Cuomo said you campaign in poetry and govern in prose. Hillary Clinton's uh, sort of fail-safe is prose. Mm -hmm. And um, she needs to give a speech. I agree with Stan that the economy has to be the spine of it, but she has, it has to be infused with a bit of her own story mm -hmm. and values. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, because economic issues are more than just one-offs. There's a value structure. We believe in this country that if you work hard, you should get ahead. You ought to be able to make a decent living, that you, you know, people ought to be able to get the education they need, especially in this new economy. Uh, to keep the American dream, which a lot of uh, Americans don't believe exists anymore, to revitalize that, to re recommit ourselves to that. And, she needs to speak in value-laden terms. Uh, she doesn't do it enough. And tonight, you know, she has to sound less like a wonk and more like someone who uh, is infused with those values and that, and that sense of advocacy. I, I, think, I think she also has to, <coughs> she has to make her own personal appeal to people. Uh, President Obama made an appeal on her behalf last night to voters you know, made an organizing appeal, actually, for people to get out there and work uh, to elect Hillary. I think she has to do that also. She doesn't have to make an organizing appeal, but she has to make an ask of the American people. Vote for me and look at what we can do together. Uh, and lay out that vision of why she wants to be president and how we're, we're all going to do this together. In stark contrast to somebody who stands up and says, I alone can fix this, she needs to broaden that and talk about how together under a Clinton presidency, where, the, where we're going to take the country. You know, this speech, it reminds me a little bit of George H.W. Bush's convention speech challenge in, 2000, in, in 1988, because there were these pre, you know, first he's following a very charismatic president, and there were some um, presumptions about him, you know, the wimp factor and all of that. And he, con you know, he, he did a lot in that speech to sort of 
uh, transform views of him, take some of the negative views and transform them. Uh, and he uh, enlarged himself in that speech. So he owned some of that stuff and basically said, without saying it, you know, I'm not Ronald Reagan, but here's who I am. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, so she has the opportunity to define herself and maybe concede some things, concede what she's not, but lift up what, who she is. But, Patty, isn't part of the challenge uh, for her with the poetry thing, not just tonight, but throughout the campaign, the fact that she's kind of allergic to overpromising? You know, that her, uh, you know, her modus operandi is always to say, you know, here's what I think we can realistically accomplish rather than I'm going to get the sun, the moon, and the stars for you. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the kind of rhetoric that, you know, the hope and change rhetoric that lends itself to, you know, to, to that poetry. And, it, you know, it sort of would not be in keeping with who she is to, That's you know, exactly right. I mean, that is not who she is at all. She's a very responsible, um, you know, she was the breadwinner in her family for a very long time. She's the worrier in the family. She's the one who, you know, um, is concerned that Chelsea has everything that she needs, that, you know, this is a great story. One, one time they were traveling out of the country on the 4th of July uh, while they were in the White House. And um, as they were getting on the plane, she made a call and said, can you make sure that they have enough fireworks? <laughs> can you just call the social office and make sure? I'm like, what do you, she's the worrier in the family. She is not gonna uh, make any promises that she can't deliver on. That's not sexy, that's not exciting, that's not, um, you know, people may not vote on that. But how do you turn that into a strength instead of a weakness in the eyes of voters? I think people are going to look at what she's accomplished as a public servant. I think that's what, that's what this convention has been about, uh, whether it was her uh, time at the Children's Defense Fund, whether it was her time registering you know, uh, Hispanic voters in Texas, whether uh, it was her time as First Lady, as Senator, as Secretary of State. Uh, it may not be sexy, but you know. Is. Isn't her tenacity, which we've heard right. about, yeah. isn't her tenacity, which is a genuine quality, don't you have to convert her tenacity into an asset for people? Yeah. This notion that she will never quit yes. fighting for and them. And that she solves problems. I mean, I don't think, I agree with you. You know, one of the, uh, the really in 2008, you were there, mm -hmm. uh, the contrast that she sought to set with. Uh, Barack Obama, and it, it didn't work out in that exchange in that year, uh, was I, I know how the system works and I can right. get things done. Right. And you know, you are being unrealistic and you're setting these, <clears throat> and that was, um, but I, I don't think you have to choose between being aspirational and being practical. Mm -hmm. um, I think you can speak about the values you're driving toward and still um, be the tenacious, kind of navigator Let, who can get us there. Let's turn to the general election a little bit before we bring in uh, the audience and uh, kind of look at it both demographically and geographically. <laughs> if you look at it demographically, uh, Hillary Clinton has at this point in the polling two, I think, uh, preeminent uh, problems. They're very different in kind. One is that Donald Trump is showing a lot of appeal for working class white voters. Democrats have shown they can win the White House without winning most white working class voters. But, you know, there is a you point. Get some of them. You got to get some of them. There's a point at which it becomes dangerous if you go down too low. So that's the first problem. The second problem is that she's underperforming with young people who are not necessarily going to Donald Trump, mm -hmm. but are either moving to the third party or not. Clear thing. So let's talk about each of those uh, in sequence. Mm -hmm. um, how big a problem, I mean, you know, in, in, in the CNN polling that came out in between the conventions, they had Donald Trump at 69% among non-college white men, 64% among non-college white women, very similar to what Stan, your polling had right before. Why is it so tough, and what are her assets, if any, to try to cut into that Trump advantage? First of all, this is, this, look, Trump is, for the first Republican who's thrown out all the austerity, you know, worrying about, you know, more tax cuts for the rich corporations, <clears throat> focusing on trade, job creation, uh, America first. Um, and the, and so has, I think has made the challenge greater. But there's a democratic problem um, that was true under President Obama. It's true now. 
which is this, which is to say there are a lot of people struggling, um, long-term income um, decline, and to be honest, Democrats have not either made it their central task or done anything about it. And so when we lost voters in 10 and 14, you, you go to the, uh, to the working class part of our base. So you look at married, unmarried, sorry, unmarried women, a key part of the rising American electorate. They disappeared and underperformed in the off-year election. They weren't that great in 12 because, you know, if, if you're an unmarried woman, you are on your own, vulnerable, much low, less income, um, and they're struggling. He's not, right now, Hillary is not doing that well with unmarried women. She's about at 2012 levels, you know, they, so that there is there are struggling voters out there. It's not just white working class men. Mm -hmm. There are struggling voters out there, probably a majority of the electorate, who, where this economy does not work. Um, and, the, and Democrats have not really had an offer. We had a recovery. We take credit for the recovery, and it's a huge accomplishment. It's an historic accomplishment. But it doesn't address any of the big structural economic issues that Bernie Sanders was raising. How much of it is cultural, the other side, about uh, unease about demographic change and unease at the very transformation of the country that the convention has celebrated, David, over the first three nights? Well, that is, there, there are two dangers. You know, you asked at the beginning, what is the danger of this, the messaging in the convention? The first one is the one Stan mentions. There is something that's been going on for decades, and he started doing research on it in the 80s. And McComb County, 1984. Uh, that goes to the, the, the dislocation that these revolutionary changes in the global economy have wrought. Technology, globalization. There are winners and there are losers, and that's what's driving this great, you know, there, there are policy elements to it, but that's basically what's driving inequality and, what, and this sense that, you know, there are a lot of people whose jobs were uh, made obsolete uh, as much by technology as globalization who now are working for much less and you know there's a lot of anger about that and then you overlay these demographic changes and um, it's a very easy leap and Trump made it to say it's their fault and uh, <coughs> so you know if I'm one of those disaffected people uh, white working class voters and I'm watching this convention um, I haven't yet seen myself mm -hmm. probably enough. Uh, you know, I think Biden yeah. was a yeah. great, exception. great exception, bridge right. to those uh, voters. It'll be interesting to see tonight, you know, whether there's more of an outreach to them. But I think that the, 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 the bet they're making is that, um, that, you, that she can reassemble in the main the Obama coalition and that there are enough uh, college-educated voters, whites who uh, voted for Mitt Romney, who can't get there with Trump. We'll come back to that in a minute, and, and Nancy, mm -hmm. I just want to finish on uh, bringing Stephanie on the other half of where she's underperforming, which is the, yeah, a key part. People. Young people. Mm -hmm. There was a poll out yesterday from Project New America and Next Gen Climate looking at millennials in the battleground states. 75% of them said Donald Trump was a racist. 75% said he doesn't respect women. 69% said they would be ashamed for the country if he was elected. In a four-way race, Hillary Clinton was winning 43% of them. That's it. Mm -hmm. How big an issue does she face with young people? It, it's an issue. Um, uh, and I think at the end of the day, she'll get their support. Um, it's a matter of whether or not they'll come out uh, and show up at the polls. Um, and I think this convention, uh, you know, they may not have spoken to um, the uh, economic downtrodden, but they did speak to young people. Mm -hmm. The celebration of diversity, um, the the how far we've come on equality for gay rights, or the demonstrations of um, uh, <coughs> the celebration of uh, curbing gun violence. I mean, I've done a lot of conventions uh, mm -hmm. in my career, and we've never done that. Uh, and those types of displays over the last three, and ultimately tonight too, I really do speak to those younger voters and, the, and painting the picture of what kind of a country this Stan, country will be under a Clinton presidency. And Stan, how much can some of these top surrogates move the needle for her over the next couple of months? You know, part of the challenge was that this uh, primary contest went on so long, mm -hmm. uh, beyond the last mm -hmm. primary, uh, in Bernie Sanders' view, 
that a lot of these, uh, you know, these top surrogates like the president, the vice president, Elizabeth Warren, of course, Bernie Sanders himself, really couldn't get off the sidelines and and campaign vigorously on her behalf mm -hmm. out of respect for him. So moving forward, who helps with those young voters? Who helps with those independent voters the most? Is it the president? Is it uh, is it Tim Kaine? Does she appear with them together? Do they go off separately? Well, All of the, the, the millennial this millennial vote is probably the the single most important you know piece to address, and also that could move fairly dramatically right. over the course, and it's very unlikely to move to Trump. If you're, what the probabilities are that it's going to you know, raise her margin as the problem gets uh, addressed. But the core problem, I mean, the reason why Sanders is getting 85 percent you know, of the uh, millennial vote in the primary is he was going at the, the core problem. They think this, uh, our politics is corrupt. Mm -hmm. They think the politicians are, are bought and so, uh, sold. They think that corporations, and they're very focused on corporations, <coughs> they're the most anti-corporate segment of the electorate, who they think the companies or uh, CEOs are selling out their country, they're not investing in their own, uh, their own companies. And there's a very strong critique both of, the corp of corporate America, and, but also of uh, politicians who are bought by big money and produce a government that doesn't work for them. And that's the heart of it. And so when, when you go to the question of who, you know, of, of who obviously, you know, Bernie and, um, and Elizabeth Warren are the obvious people, but it's 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 just got to be from the the candidate. This, uh, Hillary Clinton has to own that critique of what's going on in America. That's what will move them. Now, I think they will, but we have the exact same numbers. We have, and we do have a quarter of voting Libertarian mm -hmm. and third party candidates right now. You know, in our poll. That's and exactly I, what they had in their poll. And I, and I but and I think they will. I think they'll stay there. This is, I think it's real uh, unless. They hear that the Democratic Party represents change, will take a tackle, will begin to go after the corruption, lead in reform. And so it's, it's people, but it's also surrogates. Can't, in fact, surrogates are a problem. Listen to the surrogates. Every, yeah. uh, surrogates are, you know, are mainly saying things are going great. There aren't much. There aren't many change agents mm. in the circus that I'm listening to, except for Bernie. I mean, if and Bernie right. starts uh, actively campaigning for her, yeah. and you know, the other thing that is going to move young people is their fear of Trump, and yes, you can right. you can already see that happening. And now that we're coming out of the conventions. The choice is becoming clearer. The, fo the race is incredibly Let, more Let's bring in the audience. You can also yeah, separate right. out millennials because there's also, there are also race Hev differences. Heavily diverse. Yeah, absolutely. And, Over you know, 40 I think that the white. Obamas, for example, could have an impact in minority mm -hmm. communities mm -hmm. in, moti mo in motivating mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that vote. But, 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 uh, but on this issue that you raised, Stan, which I think is very, very valid and important, mm -hmm. This is the challenge for Hillary Clinton because if you say we're going to challenge and change the the corrupt system, right. um, you know she isn't the obvious answer to lead mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Effort. Let, let me but button no, up this but conversation. Can I just say one thing ahead, about yeah, sure. surrogates? Um, so, I mean, we all know here that uh, presidential election is about the electoral college, and we're talking about mm -hmm. eight, maybe nine states. And if there, if if all of these surrogates are to strategically dispatched to the proper constituent and state. It's very effective. And let's remember, Donald Trump has nobody other than Pence to cover a lot of ground in a relatively short period of yeah. time. And on, on, our, on our side, on the Democratic side, it's, it's, it's an embarrassment of riches, really. Let, let, me, let me button up, thank you, on, on this question of kind of the, the coalitions. And we've said the two areas where Hillary Clinton is struggling are the blue-collar whites and the uh, and young people. Uh, then you've got the other two questions, right? Which is, right now, she is, in a, she is as strong as she is because she is running better than it, really any Democrat ever among the college-educated white. Going back in the history of polling in 1952, no Democrat, according to the polls, has ever won most college-educated whites, including Lyndon Johnson in 1964. But she's even or ahead in most polling. On the other hand, even while she is even or ahead, a majority of them in polls say they have an unfavorable view of her. So is that, how, you know, how solid ground is that for her at this point, if that is the basis of her competitiveness, is that Trump is underperforming with college whites, but yet a majority of them view her unfavorably, does that make you nervous that she's depending on voters who don't express very high opinion of her? 
Stephanie, you want to maybe start? It, it, does it make me nervous? Yes. Yeah. Sure, it makes me nervous, except uh, I think most of us have said this at some point, uh, it's the outrunning the, the bear. The bear. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, you know, if most of uh, that voting bloc doesn't trust her, you know, double that and they don't trust him at all. And I think that her voting block is much bigger than that because mm. I do think that the Obama coalition is much more complex uh, and will turn out for her. They already have in some polls. Uh, she's at or where or above where the president was at this point in 2012 mm. with some of those constituencies. So I, you know, I'm, I'm nervous about everything, but I'm, I'm Can not she nervous enough to turn advantage out. with college mm. whites, Stan. Yeah. First of all, I'm not nervous. I mean, I know the last ad that we ran with Clinton was scrolling the economists and, and, uh, and CEOs saying that the Clinton economic plan would really improve the economy. We're gonna see the ad that scrolls, not so much Republican, yeah. that scrolls, I think national security officials, foreign policy, who in fundamental ways will talk, and we'll see this scrolling list of people who say you can't, you know, we're at great risk, and I think college educated voters who are defecting, I think will be reinforced. But let me go with this, because like, there's something huge going on in, in the Republican Party that's big and structural in some ways, and more important than Hillary's unfavorability. Because at the same, what, what happened here is we now know the Republican Party is a white working, is dominated by white working class voters. The primary was a white working class primary. Now, we thought, normally, we thought this would be fought out on who's the, the, the best social conservative. What Trump did was say, Guess what? <coughs> well, we're going to vote for somebody who's going to stand up for American jobs and be America first, and, and, and he ran on the economy, not religious issues. But what college-educated voters did is watch that prom primary and was alienated from it. And why college-educated voters have locked in, still in favor, they're Republican, but the reason why they are responding to it, they are disgusted with their own party. Mm -hmm. The issues being fought, the style of the politics, the values, um, has pushed college educated voters to it, to say pretty f frankly that they'll vote for Hillary Clinton. And I'm, I'm, they can be unfavorable at the same time. Can I just ask, because I just spotted Ron Fournier, who just wrote a very provocative article uh, yesterday or the day before. Uh, that's, so, that's so interesting. <laughs> exactly. Arguing that, arguing that reporters should uh, boycott uh, interviewing Trump until he releases his tax returns. Brilliant. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a an issue I don't have to tackle because I cover the Democrats, but um, uh, what, what can the Democrats do, if anything, to try to force him to release his tax returns? Is there anything that Hillary Clinton or the president you know, uh, can, can say or do to try to push You know, him I think part of it is um, only he knows what's in the tax returns. Right. And whether it is more costly for him not to release them than it is for him to release them. I suspect there are things in those tax returns that make it too costly to release them, and he won't release them, uh, you know, under any circumstances. Uh, you know, and, and we're not going to see them unless the Russians hack into them. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to go to the audience. How good are the IRS servers? We'll go to the audience segment. Let's just quickly talk about the last piece of the demographic puzzle. We talked about non-college wise, young people, college wise. But the, obviously the other key question is can she get the margins and turnout that the president did among voters of color? Uh, that was critical to his success. Um, there are polls, there have been some large scale national polls that have had him under 20 among Hispanics uh, compared to the 27 that Mitt Romney had. There were polls in Pennsylvania and Ohio by NBC Marist that had him at zero among African Americans. They could not find one uh, in the poll. Um, plus or minus four. Plus or minus four. Um, so, but, you know, obviously turnout is an issue. Uh, Ohio, the turnout was heroic, epic among African American voters. Would you be, uh, how concerned or confident would you be about her ability to I increase, maintain, the margins among voters of color compared to 2012? You know, uh, this is where I think the Obamas are going to be very, very important. Um, and uh, uh, I think they can be uh, agents in this, in this regard. But Trump himself, I think, is, a, is, an, is, you know, obviously among Hispanic mm -hmm. voters. Yeah. I mean, it is incredible to think about that postmortem that they did after the 2012 election saying, you know, the key to victory in becoming a national party is to greater outreach to Hispanics, women, and young people. So how do you think that project's going? 
Uh, and I, you know, I, he's, he he's has a whole different paradigm, as Stan, as Stan mentioned. But he is, he is provocative in a way that I think uh, will help bring these minority voters out. P Patty, mm -hmm. what do you think? I, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think the most effective tool that Hillary has in terms of getting out the brown vote and the black vote is Donald Trump. I mean, he has demonized, I'm, I'm Mexican American, he has demonized my people. Uh, and he continues to double down, triple down. I mean, his um, uh, speech at the convention was so anti-immigrant, so anti uh, anybody who's different. Uh, we've already seen anecdotal evidence that uh, Hispanics are registering, his people who are uh, eligible to become citizens are actually taking that leap to become citizens, to be citizens so that they can vote against him. So um, absolutely the Obamas are going to be important. You know, Tim Kaine can speak Spanish and he's going to, but I think Trump is the, our most effective weapon at getting that vote out. Let's bring in the audience and then we'll take it back for a final question each. Uh, we got one right on the bar there behind you, Lindsay, right there, yeah. Just identify yourself. Hi, I'm Christine Jacobs. I live here in Philadelphia. Um, I love listening to this. I live in the liberal bubble myself. I think this is all lovely. <laughs> like but us? Yeah, Yikes. Uh, yes, you. <laughs> but periodically, when I want to get figure out what's going on in other parts of the country, I listen to Trump's number one uh, surrogates, and that's Fox News. And this morning on Fox, they were making a big deal about Terry McAuliffe's comments yesterday about TPP. And I've already my heard circus. from my Bernie-supporting, college-educated, <laughs> tech-savvy, white male sons who live in Silicon Valley who have told me that this is typical, that she's saying she's anti-TPP, and as soon as she's elected, she'll go and support it. Mm -hmm. I, and it's mm -hmm. killing us. I, I would just note that on this stage yesterday, Gene Sperling, who uh, was the head of the NEC under President Obama and President Clinton, and obviously an advisor to, to Hillary Clinton, said, that she would not seek to renegotiate or change. She is done with it. It is, it is done. She said, he, his quote was, it is in the rear view mirror. And when I tweeted a short version of what he said, bury, not fix, he retweeted it. So mm -hmm. they are trying to, but the larger question, I mean, that, mm -hmm. that goes to the trust. Right, well, I'm, well, okay, well, <laughs> that, that may be. But the larger question about whether Clinton is just kind of, you know, a politician who will say and do anything and, and therefore you can't really trust her, Stan. First of all, let me just note that the, media, that the median uh, age for the Fox viewers is 69. So just as we just as we think about the country and look at the convention, just Fox is irrelevant. But it doesn't, but it doesn't, <laughs> but it doesn't, doesn't change the, uh, the importance of the issue that uh, you're raising. When, and when I use the surrogates, I'm using it kind of like, you know, our, the Democratic story, you know, is... Um, you know, has, is, has not talked about the kind of Bernie issues as central and, and constantly have to walk back the kinds of statements that the, you know, the, uh, the governor made. Um, and uh, I think, the, you know, the, it'll be important what Hillary does tonight um, and sends a message, because everybody's like following the lead from what happened in the campaign a month ago or two, or, you know, or two weeks ago. They're waiting for what is, where is this party you know, going forward? The speech tonight is where that gets shaped. Um, and she's gonna, have, you know, she's gonna have to win the trust of some of those voters saying, I'm serious about this in terms of what she's been saying. Lindsay, you have another back there? Thanks so much. I'm Susan Shane from uh, California. And part of the California strategy in the primary was getting uh, Hillary voters in particular, to vote early and often. So uh, absentee <laughs> voters, early voting, wherever that happened to be, especially in light of the barriers put up by the recent Supreme Court ruling. <coughs> so I wondered how that might play out, especially in battleground states, for Trump versus Hillary. Your thoughts you on know, that? You know, I think one of the great um, sort of underreported stories, but I think will be become more prominent now that the conventions are over, is the sort of gap in capacity between uh, the Clinton campaign and the Trump campaign. Trump basic, you know, he's a, he, everybody's strength is their weakness. He's not part of the system. He, he is the, the ultimate media candidate. But he doesn't have a clue about how modern campaigns are run. 
And modern campaigns, in modern campaigns, you know, media and message gets you way down the field, but the field goal team is, you know, data-driven voter contact uh, and the ability to operate these kinds of elements of a campaign, uh, getting people to early vote and so on. Um, he, he doesn't have that. And I think the lack of that capacity is going to be meaningful in any state, a battleground state that is, is, is reasonably close. She's going to have an advantage. Uh, David, over here, up here. Hi, uh, Dave Lutter from the Los Angeles Times. Uh, you talked about her need to, uh, to make the economic message, but let me ask you about one other big topic that has been relatively absent from the convention so far, uh, and that's been terrorism. Uh, the president did mention it uh, in, in the uh, speech last night, and there's obviously been by implication uh, the talk of, uh, about you can't rely on an unsteady commander in chief, but have they done enough to address uh, public fears about, uh, about terrorism and to uh, set the predicate for what could happen in the fall when you know, odds are fairly strong that sometime between now and November there will be mm -hmm. another significant attack? Stephanie, what do you think? You know, I think, uh, I think you'll probably hear some of that tonight. You heard some of it last night. Um, have they set, done enough to set the predicate for the fall? Um, I think we have a long way to go uh, before we set the predicate, including three debates, which will be more determinative on that question than I think a convention. A question up here? General yeah. Allen, by the way, I don't think he's on the program tonight to talk about yeah. the economy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> question up here. Hi, my name is James Wasserman. I'm Philadelphian, and um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the debates and, and how to handle um, somebody who's so, uh, you know, such a media personality. <laughs> Where's Ron Klain when you need him? Okay. Uh, Patty, what do you think? You know, um, Hillary Clinton is a phenomenal debater. She's just, she's... Uh, Obviously, she knows the issues inside and out, uh, backwards and forwards. She uh, prepares, she studies, uh, she takes it very seriously. Um, having said that, you know, Donald Trump fared pretty well in the debates. I think he thinks he won all of them. Um, but he, he was on a stage... By a uh, lot. <laughs> by a lot. He was on a stage with a lot of people. It is, it is very different when you are... Uh, it, it's just the two of you. You're one-on-one. -on -one. Um, uh, you either rise to the stature of the moment or you don't. And I just do not see uh, Donald Trump rising to the stature of a presidential debate against Hillary Clinton. But she's willing to prepare it. for it. I mean, I... He, you know, I, I I mean, he hasn't there are going to be 15 minute segments on issues that are fairly yeah. rigorous, and you can't, he's going to have to get beyond these kind of uh, bromides, and he's going to be asked details. And I think that's going to be a big test for him with these college educated yeah. whites we, we, we were yeah, talking yeah, right. about. We're, 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 60 percent of them in the polling, in the Washington Post poll, said he is not qualified to be president over here. Hi, my name's Devin O'Banion. I'm from Chicago. Um, hey. <laughs> And um, I fall into the millennial category, so that's one of the groups we were talking about. My question was about how Hillary Clinton's uh, past, will, what role that will play. We've seen at the convention them try to paint her past in a positive way, but for a lot of millennials and for the blue collar white workers, it's her past that, you know, makes people. What elements of her past? Um, well, the fact that, for me, examples, the super predators thing when she didn't support gay rights, the stuff, the Honduras coup, all that kind of stuff. Okay. So can we talk about that? What do you think they should do? And do you think the American people will buy it? Patty, you were there for much of that. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I was there for some of it, not all of it. Um, you know, she, uh, the, the, the super predators comment, I think she's addressed it on the campaign trail. She uh, has uh, met with the Black Lives Matter movement. She, um, even at this convention, she, 
she's about compassion. She knows what it takes to bring people together, right? Uh, this convention has been about compassion versus uh, fear. But much of what her past is was her husband's administration. And I don't think that you can uh, knock her for what her husband's administration has right. done. The super predator thing was the wrong thing to say. I think she's apologized for it. Um, uh, and again, you know, campaigns are about choices, yeah. right? Are you going to choose Hillary Clinton or are you going to choose Donald Trump? And I think young people are going to have to make that decision. One thing I would suggest to Democrats is uh, to uh, seize on the parable of 2000 because there was a parallel situation. Yeah. I mean, there were, and, and Stan was there, he was working for Al Gore. Uh, there were a lot of people, and a lot of them were young, who had some of the same concerns mm -hmm. about him. Mm -hmm. Many of them voted for Ralph Nader. In yeah. the state of Florida, Al Gore lost by history, we'll say, 527 votes. There were 80, 90,000 90, votes 90, for Ralph Nader. Votes? But, but in any counting. case, 90,000 or so <laughs> votes for Ralph Nader. If, if 1,000 of them had voted for Al Gore, uh, very likely we wouldn't have been in Iraq, we wouldn't have squandered a $2 trillion surplus on tax cuts for the wealthy, we would right. not have, we would have been way down the road on climate change. These things matter. They really matter. And uh, so you don't want to be sitting here five and ten years from now and kind of thinking, yes, yeah, she wasn't perfect, but uh, so you know, and, and you Donald Trump won the election, because yeah. that could be a historic decision and not in the way you hope. Yeah, the, if, you, if you talk to real voters, not that you're not a real voter, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, not, it's not super predators, those aren't the issues. Um, it's, not, it's not whether, you know, the, in the White House, how supportive of her husband. The issue, was, the issue for, uh, for millennials uh, is that they think she's a typical politician, she thinks she, and a lot of this is um, Bernie Sanders led through the primaries, um, uh, whether true or not. She's the candidate of Wall Street. She's the one who won't stop big money. She's taking super PAC money. They, uh, if you talk to millennials and you go to their biggest doubt, it's they think she's aligned with the elites, typical politician, aligned with big money in Wall Street. That, that's the, rather than arcane positions, that is real current critique. Um, and what they have to get past in getting to a vote. Uh, we, could, we could certainly do this all day, but we've got to let these, people, these folks get on with their, their morning. So, Nancy, do you have, maybe I don't, each of us will have a final question for the, for the gang. Sure. So uh, my, my question was, how do you see uh, Tim Kaine's role going forward? How do you think he will help the most, and why didn't you pick him eight years ago? Why did you choose yeah. Vice President Biden wow. instead? <laughs> Um, well, we talked about it and thought he might be more useful on the ticket in 2016. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, no, listen, the reason that uh, he didn't make as much sense for Barack Obama because, as both of them noted, he was too much like Barack Obama, yeah. his background, uh, his sensibilities, his, his age and his level of experience didn't match what we uh, needed on our ticket. He was highly regarded. He was a finalist. Uh, for the vice presidency. I think that the thing about Tim Kaine, you have to think more broadly. We tend to think in narrow categories. Ultimately, what she is selling here, I think, is stability, reliability, a sense of comfort, you know, versus the temperament of Donald Trump. And Tim Kaine is a very solid guy. So that's number one. Number two, he, he does come from a swing state. I think that's always overrated, but it's not bad. Virginia's a swing state. He's a Midwesterner, and he has a story told last night. He can go into the Midwest and, and I think, campaign effectively. That's a big battleground. And then and the, and the Spanish thing is big. I mean, you know, when you, Florida is a blocking state, for example. His ability to campaign there... Uh, and to spend a lot of time on Spanish language television, yeah. I think is a very big deal. Stephanie, as a communications director, I'm sorry, go ahead, Patty. I, I, for me, 
he's a nice guy, and you can tell she really likes him. I think when they hit the trail together, he's really going to do a lot to warm her up and mm -hmm. make her feel more at ease, and that's going to come off on the campaign trail. I, I, I think he's going to do a lot to just make her happy and warm her up, and I think they're going to make a really good team. I, I, you know, they're going to go on a bus tour uh, coming out of Philadelphia tomorrow, and Stan was there for the Clinton-Gore bus tour in 92. I, I predict that they're just going to have a lot of fun together, and that's you're going to see that um, come through. My main memory of the Clinton-Gore bus tour is that with every hair in place, Al Gore threw a perfect spiral when they went out to play football, and Bill Clinton <laughs> threw a wounded duck that <laughs> fluttered. <laughs> it was just, it was so, you just picture Al Gore as that high school quarterback. Yeah. Um, let me ask my own final question, which is about the Electoral College. I mean, we've basically, over the last several cycles, been fighting over the same 11 states. We've got six older, predominantly white states, New Hampshire, Michigan, Pennsylvania, I'm kind of coming from at least, you know, but Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Iowa, and uh, Ohio, kind of a Rust Belt group of swing states. And then we have this emerging group of Sun Belt swing states, which is Virginia, North Carolina, Florida, and the Southeast, Colorado, Nevada, and the Southwest. Uh, Stan, as you look at the Electoral College, what do you expect to get easier mm -hmm. for Hillary Clinton, and what do you expect to get harder? Look, up, you know, up until now, you could take the rank order of states um, and keep it the same in every election in terms of, you know, the, you look at the national number and, but the rank order of the states on where, how they're performing pretty much stayed the same. Um, I think we're, I think we were at an inflection point, um, and particularly in an election where Hillary is doing well with college educated voters in the most, metro, in the cosmopolitan growing metro areas as well as in the diverse rising American electorate. That combination makes you know, states that were trending Democratic maybe abruptly move. And so Florida, may not, Florida and Colorado may not even be close. It may, it may be places that they, they're not buying media. And we keep like, focusing on Ohio as like, that's the battleground that matters because that's right at the point where the Electoral College shifts. Well, the Electoral College may be gone before you get to Ohio. Because Florida and Colorado uh, and Virginia, Virginia. Uh, which are not in, on the blue wall, yeah. just to use a okay, phrase of that. Get my nickel, yeah. Get my nickel. yeah. Um, and so it's not the right, that's not the point where, and North Carolina, almost every poll has her ahead. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a different, the, the rank order may change. Stephanie thought what gets easier, what gets tougher? Well, I think, you know, ultimately it's all about how many pathways you have to get to 270, and the difference between uh, Hillary and Trump. I think Hillary has multiple pathways to get there. Um, as Stan said, Colorado, Virginia, North Carolina, uh, you know, if for some reason she doesn't win in Ohio, I fully expect that she would, she still has many pathways to get to 270. Trump does not. Trump has to do the traditional pathway of Ohio, Florida, or Pennsylvania. Um, so that makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. We are expanding our map. And he, he's following the traditional map. David, I your thought. In that Rust Belt bucket, in that Sun Belt bucket, where are you most concerned and where are you most optimistic? Well, I, look, I think you, if he can't, his whole thing, he has to draw an inside straight. And uh, Pennsylvania and Ohio, it seems to me, are key cards uh, in that. And I just want to go back to something that uh, I said earlier, because I think in Ohio in particular, where he, ha where he, the governor is not supporting him, uh, and where they went out of their way to antagonize the governor when during their convention, uh, where they have a Senate candidate that they care far more about than they care about Donald Trump, and where he has no ability to really superimpose his own organization, uh, that's a you know I think that's going to end up being a real disadvantage for him uh, in trying to win a state that he absolutely has to have. I mean, I think that's the extreme example of where this sort of Lone Ranger approach that he has uh, and a kind of backward-looking approach to organization is going to hurt him. Well, it's been a pleasure to be here with Nancy this morning. Uh, second, I think you will agree, this has been a terrific panel. Join me in thanking them. Third, please come back for lunch. What could be better? In fact, we, 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 we virtually have gone on to lunch, but you can almost stay for lunch. <laughs> yes. We'll start serving at 1130 at noon. Our next conversation begins, Pathways to Power, about attracting women to politics. Thank you, and we'll see you in four years. <laughs> wow. <laughs>